I'm going to see if I can figure out who wasn't here by looking at my uh, list of people. But it's not in the same order as the list on Canvas here. So I can't really do it quickly. I'll just have to look after class, I guess, to see. Because we're getting close to what they consider midterm at the school. I'm not sure exactly what the dates are, but they have some withdrawal dates and things like that that you have to meet if you're not going to stay in the class. OK, give me a green light if you can hear me. Also, let me stretch my window out here so I can see everybody. There we go. That's easier now. We got 24, and I think we're supposed to have 25. Yeah. Okay. So let us get going here. Uh, start with the administrative stuff about the exam. Next Monday night is the exam, first exam. If somebody is uh, getting all worried about their grades and things, they start now, uh oh, we're going to get some grades. I just pointed this out, but since everybody's in the room now, we can talk about it. Uh, the exams themselves, there's two of them. It's actually three, but the third one's called the final exam. It's not really a real final exam because it uh, only counts 30% of the grade. It's not one of the real big influencers. But the test, take up, they make about half your grade. Any particular test, if you think about it, it's about a letter off your grade if you do poorly. And um, it's very important. I haven't had any real labs yet. They'll come with the programming parts of stuff. Participation, we know what that means. You're here, you're on time, you stay to the end. And when I call on you, you're there in your seat and you answer without waiting for somebody to put the answer in chat. Um, homework, uh, we've had, I think, one or two homework assignments so far. And uh, quite honestly, I won't get around to grading them probably to the end of the semester. So don't expect a grade to pop up there until the end. And that's why this is so high. I realize that in testing, I'm giving you a little more than I should. Credit, but I'm going to trust you guys not to be, uh, you know, people to cheat. And so normally in a, a remote class like this, we make the test be very low or else we put cameras on you and do all that nonsense. But I'll know who cheated. I mean, that's, that's not hard to figure out. And um, the other thing is, is we need a review in this class. So I think what I'll do is I think this Friday night, if the school has the system up, I'll go online at 6 o'clock in this room. And if you want to um, go through a little review session, we probably won't last the entire normal class time. We'll start at 6, though. And um, I'll cover some of the things I think that you may have forgotten that you may need to know in the test. Now, it's totally up to you if you come or not. There's no credit given for being in the review. There's no credit taken away for not being there. But uh, you know, it could be helpful to some of you to be able to go over some of the material again before the exam. Anybody have any questions about anything about having to do with the mechanics of how that's going to work? Uh, not really. So the uh, review session is 6 o'clock Friday night? Yep. OK. And the actual test itself, it's also at 6 o'clock Monday night? Well, we may not start at the beginning of class, but it will be during uh, class time. It'll be at our right. class on Monday night. So the, okay. the exam on Monday will take up the whole class time, right? Not necessarily. Oh, OK. okay. It, it may or may not. It depends on the number of questions I decide to give you. I have multiple tests. And I have to give one of the tests to the other class because you guys can't have the same class. It wouldn't be fair you know, to let a few people get a preview of the test you know, by a day or two. And so um, I have to decide which one I'm giving this this class. I haven't decided that yet. But it will fit within class time. The only, th the only reason it wouldn't would be if you have an extension on time or something like that. And then you're already expecting for it to take longer than the regular test time. And we don't have many of those in here. Any other questions? OK. We actually have one more class after tonight before there even the review. So we'll have caught up on everything at the end of Wednesday night that's going to be on the exam. So they'll know then whether or not the review is worth your time. 
Okay, so I had on the screen up here a file to be downloaded. Download this onto your desktop, but just don't unzip it right now. I don't, I don't post this in uh, Canvas or Blackboard because if I put it in Blackboard, it um, usually will throw some errors because it's from an HTTP source rather than HTTPS. But it, this file is safe. Uh, you may download this, and uh, we'll talk about what's in there later on tonight, probably way toward the end of class. But start it downloading just in case your machine is slow or you know, we have 25 people going against the same source. You may not run as quickly as it normally does. Stick it on your desktop. Even if you're a person that doesn't like to dirty up your desktop, you can uh, dirty it up at least to the end of the semester. And I'll explain what's in there and what we do with it and everything later. It's going to be a compiler and simulator for doing some uh, FPGA programming that we need to do. And we'll spend most of the next class talking about the details of it. But we'll get started tonight, I believe. OK, let us get going here. We're going to talk mostly tonight about programmable devices. Now, by programmable devices, I don't mean, let me actually open up another. Notepad, and I'll leave this up on the top of the screen so you can see it in case you're slow. And I can type in this window. So what we're going to talk about, and we started talking about these a little bit last time, were a category of devices called PLDs, which are programmable logic devices. And they come in all sizes and categories. And they were an innovation which allowed people to take advantage of the fact that we know how to do combinational logic. We know how to do Carnot reductions. And we know how to hook those things up. And in particular, in this class, we know how to do it using completely using NAND gates. So if we were given a limited set of resources, most problems could be solved with kind of a generic set of those hooked up in a generic way, and then later on have us be able to connect them up the way we really wanted them to work for our particular application. We started out last time, and I showed you, and we'll review a little of this as we go, with something called PALS or GALS, I mean, where it's programmable array logic or generic array logic. And what we see in the industry is that most of the programmable devices, at least on the smaller end, implement this PAL structure. There's a more advanced structure we can see, and we'll see how that's compensated for in PALs. But in general, what we do is we take and we arrange in the silicon inside a chip we arrange in a pattern looking like this. Now, we talked about this last time, but we can talk about it again. Basically, we have all of the inputs we're going to need as vertical columns. And we generate in the chip their inverses. So for all the possible inputs we have, we have available to all of the AND gates over here every signal that's possible. So what that implies is if we write our minimum sum of product equation, or at least a product equation, sum of products equation, we would be able to hook things up to the AND gate. Now, as a reminder, when there's a single input going into an AND gate, what it really means is all of the things I'm connected or could be connected to are in parallel coming into me. So these AND gates are six input AND gates because we have six possible inputs, three real inputs and their inverses. Now, initially, nothing is hooked up. So this AND gate would produce a false. When we want to use a particular term, like x1, x2, not x3, and together, we would just simply attach those signals in their vertical form to the input of this. And if those all were true, 
meaning this is one, that's one, this is zero, because we're working with the inversion, right? Then this will produce as P1 a true value. So it's a way of producing one of the terms in a one of the product terms in a sum. Of course, now this product term needs to be summed up with other product terms. And in this case, two product terms are summed in a, one single OR gate. Now, this is somewhat limiting because that means that we can only have two product terms in the equation. And we've written equations bigger than that in class, just doing some minimizations of Carnot problems. You know, A, B, or B, C, or C, D is too big to fit in this particular chip. So we have to address that in some way. And as we go on, we will ultimately not solve the problem in the biggest sense, but we'll simply say that you can always buy one with more terms and get a bigger chip if you need to. And then by the time we get that big, we'll be using chips that don't quite have the same architecture. In this case, we're able to produce two sum of products which control individual inputs into perhaps a uh, flip-flop, into perhaps uh, some other type of logic, whatever we need it to do. Now, the programmable part of this is that we can run software which will take and cause these fuses to be either blown or attached. Now, we normally think of these as all not connected, so we don't blow the fuse at the connection. Instead, we do something like create an anti-fuse. Remember antimatter? It's like antimatter. It's the opposite of a fuse. It reconnects a place where there was no connection. This allows us to work. The other advantage is it's very cheap on board to build inverters. It's very cheap to build AND gates, very cheap to build OR gates. It also turns out that we don't need to worry about making these NANDs because both are cheap to build. And since they're on the chip anyway, all we're really doing when we did a NAND here was we were putting inverters in those two positions. So if we just simply removed those, the logic, which is much, much more like the equation we were implementing, is simply ANDs and ORs. So those are easy to fabricate on chip, but would be expensive off chip because we'd be buying multiple types of devices. So when we write our minimum term sum of product equations, we can easily map them into something like this. Now this sounds painful if it gets much bigger than this. So we use software for that. And while we may be expressing it as an equation, we don't have to determine that we're going to blow fuse 0, fuse 1, fuse 2, fuse 3, fuse 4, fuse 5. We don't have to worry about which fuses are actually getting you know, restored. So by the time you get you know, 4 times 6, that's 24 fuses. We, this would be fuse number 23 down here. We'd have to determine that. Now, remember, these are not attached to a single wire. Each of these lines coming down is attached to a separate wire going in to this thing. So there's really six wires attached to this. And the connection is made between the vertical thing and its particular wire. So the top wire would be connected. The third wire would be connected. The fifth wire would be connected. And all the others are just left without any connection. So this is a very common and was used in the industry for years. Um, in modern times, we don't find these used as frequently because we can buy bigger chips and put more in them. But this, this particular pal and gal that's here are actually still produced and can be, uh, let's see, what am I doing here? purchased from a company called, my keyboard's in a funny place here, Atmel, who is owned by Microchip. And so we could actually uh, buy those. Now, I showed you last time that there were multiple ways to program these multiple kind of software packages. The oldest one is one called PALASM, 
which is kind of like an assembly language for programmable array logic. The second one that I think I showed you was, let me see, which one did I show you? I know I showed you a couple, C-U-P-L, oh, the, the second one, which is the second oldest one, is something called ABLE. And believe it or not, I don't remember what ABLE's acronym stands for. It does stand for something, but I don't remember what it is, nor do I remember what couples stand for. But couple is so still available today. If you wanted to develop something using a uh, PAL chip, you go to Atmel and you'd buy it. They actually sell it in the GAL variety normally. Just a different technology under the hood. These are normally erect, e electrically erasable and programmable. These are sometimes ultraviolet still. So we'd normally buy an electrically erasable one. And we'd buy a couple. And the actual, actually, I think they give it to you, but the uh, actual one we would use is something called Win Couple. It only runs on Windows. And its purpose in life is for you to be able to write kind of in English the equations you need. And then it figures out, given a particular device, what the sum of product equation would be to map it into that structure and figure out what fuses needed to be blown. So that's one of the uh, things that we would normally encounter. Now, we also have something in, under PLDs called programmable logic arrays. programmable logic array. They have variable and and variable or structures. And that's extremely useful, but very few chips actually implement that architecture. The PAL up here, uh, by the way, a field would be called just a variable and field. Now, what does that mean? Well, remember a few minutes ago I said with this, we're restricted with this OR gate to only having two inputs. And then we have two other ANDs that are also restricted to this. So the use of the resources isn't as flexible as we might want. If we wanted to go to a PLA, we would have an architecture look more like this. And again, I showed this to you last time. Here is our AND plane. Here is the OR plane. In this case, if you notice the OR has a single wire coming out to it. So that means this OR is connected to all four outputs of those ANDs. This one is connected to all four. So we could make any number of these go into one of these, one through four. And that gives us more flexibility. Now, in a real chip, there's more than these. So this is a very small picture. And we probably wouldn't really find a chip like this out there. But uh, typically, this technology has been more eschewed than the other one and is not as available in chips. In modern times today, you'd be hard pressed to find a need to use a PAL because there's technologies which have replaced that that are a little more attractive and just as cheap. And they also have uh, available better software tools for working with them. Now, just a reminder of the uh, one that has a, ver or a fixed and situation. You might have a chip like this one. Oops. So this chip, you notice, has an and field. Those are the lines going down which is one per input going into the device. And included in those are the feedback, possibly from some of the input output fields. So think of it as being all the inputs being brought in. And there's 32 of them because we have 16 inputs in this chip. So if we look here, the input on pin two is hooked here and here. There's also this funny looking device here. This is a combination buffer and inverter. The top line is the normal buffered signal. The bottom line is the inverted form of that signal. 
So when we put a signal on input two, both fuse, fuse line zero and one are activated. Now, pin one is input only, comes around like this and enters here. And the reason for that is because on other chips of this family, it serves an additional purpose besides just being a regular input. The pin one actually comes into the matrix on three and four, where pin two came in on one and two. Then you'll see a whole bunch of lines that don't have any connections to them. These are the ones on which you're going to blow the fuses to connect to one of these AND gates. And these AND gates are fixed in number. There's seven of them going into this one OR gate here. The eighth AND gate is used as an enabler to enable the signal coming into this inverter here. So we can use this inverter as a tri-state buffer inverter. So the signals coming out here are either the inverse of whatever's here, or they are Zs, meaning that I have disabled this so that anything hooked on a bus with this would not see a signal. Now, we need to do that anytime we make this an input pin, because in that case, we're not going to interrupt any internal logic. So we'd set this to Z in order to make it an input pin. In order to set this to Z, we have to have some logic on this AND gate and it could come from anywhere in the system that's going to allow it to in, enable the uh, chip or leave it as a Z. So if we want to make it an input, we simply leave this as a zero. We don't program this at all. Output's a zero, meaning this is turned off. Therefore, any input signals get brought into the matrix. Now, there's other forms of this, and I showed some of them to you last time, one of which is the ones that have some flip-flops available on some of the OR terms. So instead of the OR here going straight to this buffer here and then to the output, it goes to D on a particular D flip-flop. Notice that all of the flip-flops are clocked, and they happen to be clocked by that pin 1 that I told you is used in a special way on some circuits. So anytime you have flip-flops, it's not an input whether it's the clock on the current chip's flip-flops. So it'd be a great way to build a state machine or a counter where you needed these to go out externally to the world. Notice that they are followed by a buffer inverter. So whatever signal is coming out of them, which is this guy, is being inverted and then called Q. Now, we don't really know on this flip-flop, whether it's Q that they're inverting and then still calling it Q, you know, and the logic over here is taking care of making sure it's always the wrong signal here, or whether this is really Q inverted, not Q, and then this is Q coming out, going around into the matrix so that we get the feedback of our uh, flip-flop as one of the inputs back into the matrix also. That as well could be very handy because remember when we build flip-flops, the next D is always conditioned by the current Q value. We happen to have the inverted value, but it doesn't really matter because we're putting it back into the matrix in its positive and its inverted form. Now, because they put the little bubble there, it's highly suspect that this is probably really the inverted Q. And the real Q goes in here, and this is just a misname. And externally, we can think of it as Q because we've taken care in our logic of making sure it's the inverse of what we really would have wanted Q to be. So that's something that we could study for and look at a data sheet on a test or something to figure out. So that's something that we would want to pay attention to. Now, the top chip up here, its form is that uh, this guy is a, where's his name? Uh, they don't have it on the picture, unfortunately. But he is of the variety PAL16L8, where the other ones in here have an R in their name. And the R ones have a set of registers in the middle. So we have one that has four registers. We have one that has six registers. And we have one that has eight registers. So we pretty much can pick out the correct PAL chip we need. And again, this is the PAL technology. This is still available today, 
but it's not very powerful. I mean, there's a lot of stuff you could do with this, but in terms of the modern chips today, because these are not as popular as some of the other ones, while they're cheaper, they're not going to be as cheap as you might think in order to be able to get one of these. These, even in the day, were replaced by, in common usage, by something called a GAL 22V10. The V means that its outputs can be logic, they can be a register. And we don't know which they are because that's one of the other things you program when you're programming the chip. In that first chip I showed you, you're going to pick out the chip you want based on the resources you need. In this one, you're going to buy one of these chips and then you're going to the program it in such a way that you get the number of resources you need as long as it will fit in the chip. So instead of having the output buffer well defined, instead the output buffer consists of something that is called an output logic macro cell or an OLMC. So on all of what are potentially outputs, those same potential outputs could also be inputs, but they also have the ability to be either registered, because there's a flip-flop in here, pure logical, and the pure logic can be in natural state or its inverted state, or they can be inputs. And we use multiplexers to decide which they're going to be. So we have to program these multiplexers by blowing some fuses to decide which one of the things we want it to be. Now the four to one multiplexer here is going to take one of these signals coming in and turn it into something that precedes the inverter buffer here. And of course, that guy has a signal that allows us to create an invert on him as well. Uh, not an invert, uh, an enable on him. So the output of this guy can be 0, 1, or Z. Now we'd make it a Z if we want to be on a bus, or we'd make it a Z if we want to be an input. If we want to be an input, the input comes through here, goes through one of the inputs of the multiplexer and out where it's hitting its inverse or put into the matrix. Or we're going to take the inverse of Q and make it available to the matrix. So it's possible for us to feed a registered output back or it's possible to take an input and feed it into the matrix. And depending on how we configure these OLMCs, we'll get one of those. So there's four ways these can be configured. They can be configured so that we don't have the, I'm sorry, so we have the flip-flops as, as logical uh, registered mode. The flip-flop has an asynchronous reset. It has a synchronous preset. Of course, it's made party to the clock. And the output of the OR gate is going to control D. Notice there is no Boolean algebra section in this one. The same thing, but and here's the fuse numbers you have to blow. In order to get the second variation, one of the things we have to do is we have to set it so that we have active high. Now, can you see the difference? The only difference should be this particular gate here. Is in the case of active low, we invert the signal. Gate of active high, we leave the signal as it was coming out of Q. Registers quite often produce active low signals as states for other reasons. We didn't talk about that when we were building them because it wasn't necessary. But that's one of the reasons that both of these are available. Now, we don't want it registered and don't want input. One of the things we can do is we can make it an output, which is either active low or active high. Now, notice here we bypassed completely the flip-flop, and it's up to the multiplexer to select the correct thing when we do our programming of it. Now, we also said that we could turn this into an input by simply hitting this with a Z in either form and then making this an input. Same thing could happen up here. We could turn off the flip-flop output and make it an input, but that's a little more rare to do. So what do these look like? Well, they're pretty messy. There are 44 different vertical lines, and that's because there are 22 things being fed into the matrix. 
Notice if we look at our OLMC here, we'll see that the clock has a single clock line coming in, and the clock can also be a input coming into the matrix over on this side, which is where they're showing it this time. In the OLMC, we have pin 23. It can be any of those things. It can be you know, an input. The input is going to follow this bottom path in and out. It can be an output, and if it's an output, it can be either Z, 0, or 1. And the output is controlled by the top line here, the top AND gate. And it's going to be able to pass through here either registered outputs, high or low, or logical outputs, high or low, to pin 23. So pin 23 has got a lot of juice, as does 22, as does 21. But to help us with the problem we had with the number of AND gates going to an OR gate, if you look at the outside OR gate here. It can handle eight ands. Now, it was seven in the other, but in this case, it's and uh, eight because they threw in an extra one for the clock. I'm sorry, for the enable pin. But the outside edges have eight, 10 here, 12 here, 14 here, 16 here. So by the time you get here, you could have a 16-termed product equation, each of which had 22 inputs. You're not going to write anything that big and complicated. So this would be more than likely all you'd need for most static standard type of logic. Now, this still isn't very big in terms of modern day stuff. But at the time this was popular, you had a hard time filling up one of these chips with logic in order to do something. And some of the early microcomputers and controllers would have these chips on board. Now, also coming to these is a signal, if you notice up here, which is the asynchronous reset, it goes to all the registers. So if you're a register and in register mode, if that pin is enabled, which would be done by fusing ourselves to one of the input lines, then it would cause that pin to be set to all zeros internally. We also have a synchronous reset, which goes to all of the registers in there. And it happens synchronized with the clock. And the clock is a rising clock. Notice there are a couple of pins which are like this guy here comes in as pure input. This guy comes in as pure input. In its name, the name of this guy is a V or is a 22 V10. The 22 means that we have 22 coming in, of which most of them are inputs. However, 10 of them have the OLMCs on them, so they can do various other functions. For a long time, this was my favorite chip, because I could do anything with this. You couldn't stop me if I had one of these in you know, 10 minutes to program it. But when I'm talking programming here, notice we're talking differently than the, what we would call hardware, or what we call software programming in a high-level language like C. Here we'd be using one of those languages like Palasm, Able, or Couple which really are more suitable for describing what the hardware does rather than telling it how to do it. That's one of the key differences between being a hardware programmer and a software programmer, both of which are very necessary, and your best people can do both. OK, let's move ahead. Does anybody have any questions about the material we've been talking about so far? Yeah, I assume you've got this on your desktop now. Okay, the next layer of this that I want to talk about is something called complex. programmable logic devices. And their acronym is CPLD. Now in size and everything, they kind of sit between, oops, not sit. CPLDs and things like FPGAs, which we'll talk about later in terms of their uh, ability. 
So they're more complicated than what I just showed you. They really require a different kind of programming language in order to program them. Couple is probably not going to be potent enough to be able to describe how you would use those and what you would do with them. Now what's particularly important about these is that they can additionally, besides the logic, have on-chip non-volatile memory. memory. And what that means is you can actually put some memory cells on their chip. One of the big problems with the programmable logic devices we were talking about earlier was that the state they maintained was maintained externally. They were in the flip-flops and could be visible outside the chip, but there was nothing inside the chip that could remember any form of state. Yeah, you could feed back the flip-flops, but that probably doesn't cover enough bases if you really wanted to build something that needed more than what was just, you know, available in your output pins. CPLDs often have on-chip non-volatile memory. Because of that, and because of the technology making them, these also are non-volatile. You go, we just said that twice. Now, one of them I said the memory inside of it will remember what you put in it. The other is that this chip remains programmed even when you power it off. Just like a PAL or a PLD, any of the PLDs, the GALs or the PLAs, this guy remains programmed when you take power away from it. And that's a feature. Okay, that's one of the good things about them. So many times in very small projects, a person will use a CPLD instead of discrete logic and instead of external memory because you wouldn't need things like PROMs and EPROMs if you could remember in your own chip a little of what was going on. One of the problems with these is going to be, of course, that for the power you're getting, they're only marginally less expensive than the next level, the FPGA technology. But the, this benefit they have of not being, uh, you know, not having the power lost when you power them off, a lot, not losing what they are programmed to do when you power them off is a big benefit. That means as soon as you turn the machine on, that chip is ready to go. And we know even with flash drive, hard drives, that doesn't happen on a PC. There's some amount of time when it has to boot and it brings itself up. And all during that time, things like the North Bridge and the South Bridge and all those things, which are made of complex uh, programming devices, not this particular brand, but they're getting themselves initialized. So who makes these things? We already saw up here. And if you're going to buy one of these, you got to go to Atmel and you got to go to Microchip because nobody else is making these anymore. In the case of these guys, a couple of major players make these. Xilinx and Altera slash Intel. Intel bought Altera about five years ago, so I still use both names because a lot of the literature hasn't been updated. Their chip. It's called the Cool Runner. That's the family of chips they make. These guys make something called the Max, and it's a series of uh, things. We'll find some of them even may not really be CPLDs anymore. They may have crossed over into the world of FPGAs. But because of the fact that we will, might see them, might run across them, these turn out to be very handy. You know, for example, uh, one of the problems we worked at one time was something like, uh, what would you use, you know, or what we, I think we talked about a state machine having to do with a uh, uh, coin machine, coin changer machine. We could easily build one of those inside of a CPLD and I put all the electronics in here. And they often have enough input output pins to be able to handle all of the inputs and outputs we were talking about, including detecting what coin it was, detecting if they need to vend something, detecting if they're out of coins, detecting if they need to give change. And all that could easily be programmed into one of these. 
and still remain small and reasonably inexpensive and easy to develop on. See, one of the real advantages to this, and I'll kind of give you the, the cheating picture here and then make it right later. Um, on a CPL day, the developer can use the CPL day over and over. And there is some maximum number of times, but it's not as limited as it would have been back in the day of things like uh, a palasm or a, not a palasm, but a pal or a uh, V22s or 22 V10s. So he would use them over and over. And then the company itself could make the mass production. So if I'm gonna if I'm a company and I want to have my product contain you know some logic and I've decided the CPLD is good, then the NRE costs is relatively low, and the per unit cost is medium. Let's put plus in parentheses there. Because here's the deal with this. Let's let's assume that a CPLD costs, I don't know, let's make it cost $20. The developer can use that $20 chip over and over and over again. But then when I get ready to release them, it's going to cost me $20 per product device. Now, if I'm only making 1,000 devices, chances are pretty good that my users have money. So, I can charge them $100 product. So this $20 that I'm having to re recoup here inside the product, and this little tiny $20 that's spread across all thousand chips because it's NRA, won't mean much. So if I use a CPLD, yes, I'm going to spend more per chip, but my product base is probably smaller and because I may be one of very few companies they can buy from, as long as I'm competitive with this, I can I can get this kind of cost back. And so I'm, it's not like I'm making you know PCs for the world. It's like not like Intel is making a chip that has to run on you know 10 million PCs. Well, you got to keep the cost down, or AMD is going to come in with a chip that costs a little bit less. You know, and because it'll be comparable in performance for at least most of the people that buy the chip. I have to be more careful there. But in the case where I want to be able to develop rather cheaply, I certainly don't want to create a huge NRE cost to do this. I may decide just to go ahead and buy the thing. Now, in bigger technologies, what we're going to use is a cheap te cheaper technology, which will be FPGAs, for development. And again, for low users, we'll make FPGAs per unit, but if we have a lot, we're going to still do cheaper development in FPGAs, but we're going to switch them over to something called ASICs, which are application-specific integrated circuits, when we decide to do to the masses. How much are these in bulk? In cents? Oops. I don't have a cent sign here. Each or less, depending on how many I'm buying. So there is a huge NRE cost in the middle we don't even see here. We have relatively cheap development and one time huge NRE, hopefully one time, or we fire this guy, and then we move the thing into a different technology to send to the masses because we can make them for 10 cents each. Which competing with $20 product we have to recoup, that's a good, good deal. So we'll see that as we look at this, why we might make some decisions like that. And this is not a class where we're making that as a thing. We were going to spend an entire semester talking about these. We'd spend a lot of time. Or if I hired you to work for me doing this, we would spend a lot of time discussing how we're going to make our money back. Okay. 
So let's go ahead. Let's jump in on to a field programmable gate arrays. Does anybody have any questions about what we just talked about there? Okay, everybody give me a green light so I know there's really people out there listening to me. Okay. Now, the technologies we're talking about are modern and changing as we speak. When I was teaching this class, you know, 15, 20 years ago, these things were unapproachable by people in general. In the last few years, they've actually made some that you as a, if, you're an, if you can use an Arduino as an Arduino maker, you could, by being educated about these things, be able to go out and get a hold of, you know, a uh, development kit for very little money, under $100, in which you could develop FPGA type of uh, software. Now, building a board with an FPGA on it's a different story, but being able to do that is slowly becoming something that people can do. The vendors themselves have gotten these things so that you almost don't need to use ASICs anymore for products that are not going to be done to the, to the masses. And it may be better because the technology is actually different internally between FPGAs and the ASICs. And if you didn't do it right inside the FPGA, you could wind up spending a lot of these huge NREs in the transition between FPGA technology and ASIC. We want to do that once. And then, of course, we'll amortize that across all of the million we sell. It won't turn out to be that expensive. But it is one of the significant costs in a CPU. Okay, so let's talk now. Let me move this up off the screen so I've got a white page to work with here. So we're going to talk about build programmable gate arrays. Now, I did have one kid one semester that kept talking about how thirsty I must be. You must be thirsty, Mr. Bostain. And I'd just talk a little while longer, and I'd say something about the field program of Gatorades. And he'd say, well, I can go get you one. Obviously, what he was talking about is he, was, he thought I was saying Gatorade, you know, the drink. And so every time I'd say Gatorade, Gatorades, he uh, was, you know, becoming immediate. So he didn't have his mind on class too much. He, I, kn I know who he had it on. And uh, that story, a totally different story. It reminded me sometime to tell you that. But... Uh, Gate array for a field programmable version. Their acronym for these is FPGA, field programmable gate array. A field programmable, it means we can program it out in the field. We don't have to send something to the factory and have it rebuilt. These also are erasable. In this class, our biggest focus would be on these. They're the things that we want to really understand deeply. Now, again, major manufacturers. Let's look at that. There's Xilinx. I heard their name already. There's Altera Intel. Which is no, it's no wonder they make the CPLDs, because CPLDs are similar to the technology of FPGAs, other than the volatility part. And so it's not surprising that they make them. Certainly the software they use is very, very similar. And there are some others, but those are the main guys you'd see. The other one you might run into, an example would be, uh, who, who would be a good example for you guys? It would be Lattice Semiconductor. Links. They make chips or make FPGAs called the Vertex or the Kintex or the Artix or the Spartan. The Vertex is their newest, latest, and greatest. And the families get bigger and better as transistors get smaller and smaller. The Kintex is kind of intermediate in the Arctic. And each of these have some specialized functions as well. Some may be specialized around arithmetic. 
Some may be specialized around digital signal processing. Some may be specialized around video. So there's, and there's other things. Spartan is actually an older technology they have that they still make and sell, but it's not exactly the same specialization, nor is the uh, functions exactly the same. In the Altera Intel world, their chips, I think they are wearing out my keyboard X's here, the Agilix, Stratix, S-T-R-A-T-I-X, the area, and finally, the cyclone. Again, these are arranged, I believe I arranged them in order from highest to lowest, but I could be wrong. The cyclone is, again, an older uh, generation type of machine, a larger technology transistor. Uh, this one and these you're very likely to find on consumer boards. You probably could go out and buy a board to program that could would have one of these chips on it. I've written a zillion things using a Cyclone chip. It was one of my favorite uh, FPGAs, and uh, now I've moved on to some of these things. But this, this was the chip of choice, and I used to, you know, generally be able to shrink most of the logic in a system that was combinational down into a single chip. One of the real advantages of a single chip, and I'll go about it a little more later, is the fact that everything in there can happen in parallel if you program it to. None of this like a CPU where you got a single thread stuff, or even when you have multi-core, they have to synchronize with each other. You don't have to. In a uh, FPGA, I can have logic on one side of the chip doing one thing and logic in the middle doing something else and logic conceptually, not physically necessarily, on the other side, doing a completely different problem. And they don't have to be related in any way to each other. And that's a real advantage. That's why describing the hardware becomes so critical. Now, we need a downside. And I'm, I'm going to say this is a downside without it being one, because it turns out it's also a good side. Volatile. And I mean volatile memory and volatile in the sense that when you power one of these off, it loses its programming. So it's empty when you power it down. If you need to keep it up, you got to put a battery on it. And then when the battery dies, the programming will go away. So what we have to do is we have to think about how are we going to go about getting the thing programmed? And that's an issue. I mean, if you think about it, we have to uh, worry about the technology and what we would do to make that happen. And generally, what we do is we program them from on the same circuit board onboard EE from, which today is normally flash memory. Or there may be a microcontroller or processor, or it may even be remotely located from the board, which does it. So if I'm sitting at my chip and I want to reprogram it, I can simply power it off, power it back on again, and then from a microcontroller, send it a new program. We normally hook them up, so if there is no microcontroller currently attached, what's on the EEPROM is what's going to be loaded onto the chip. That way we can kind of have a safe way of always knowing we can put a valid program into the processor, or we can depend on a microcontroller. Now, as I said, this can be physically on the board and replace the EEPROM completely, meaning when you turn on the machine, this thing kicks into running and starts programming the FPGA. Or the FPGA knows how to use this EEPROM to program itself. Or we could have a serial input over which we could send a program. There are multiple things. that You would hear me use the term JTAG. You'd hear me use the term SWD if we were doing an advanced class on this. But it needs to be reprogrammed every time it's powered on. Now, I say this is a downside a little bit because it's got to be programmed every time you turn it on. 
But on the other hand, that also means that it can be programmed when you turn it on to something different this time. And you don't have much hoopla. You don't have to erase it. You don't have to do anything. Just simply powering it off and back on will cause it to want to be reprogrammed. So there we can take advantage of that. And they make specialized EE proms, which, which know how to hold the memory that this needs and know how to, when it's you know, basically told to load it, how to load it over what's called the JTAG interface. And again, we won't talk about JTAG in here. Maybe later when we're talking about the microcontrollers, but not, not tonight. It opens too many cans of worms. Now, the typical architecture on a FPGA is not like what we've seen at all. Intel, basically, in their system, uses what's called logic elements, LEs. It has a range, these are ranged in a big grid across the chip. Now remember these chips, the area we're talking about when I talk about these things, we're talking about, you know, a qu quarter inch by quarter inch, maybe. You know, they're tiny. And all this is shoved onto that. And uh, that's why the transistors are getting smaller, keep it about the same size, but now we have more transistors to work with. These are arranged in a grid not unlike what you would have expected in that other thing where I showed you wires going up and wires going across. But at every intersection, imagine that there's something sitting there which consists of lookup tables and registers. So kind of the same as an OLMC in a uh, PLD, you're going to find something like that at every junction of every possible connection. And they use lookup tables, which generally are just static memory. and Lookup table takes some number of inputs, quite often four, and then can generate a truth. There are many other things in there that uh, we're not going to look at the details of one, but Intel uses the term logic element. Now, down this thing in, in columns, it's kind of like the wires that were coming in. We may have embedded memory, and that would be real memory that we could save things in. We might have embedded multipliers we'd use with digital signal processing. And those guys just may be in there to be used by a particular type of chip. Additionally, they often have what are called phase-locked loops, PLLs. And the PLL is used for complicated clocking. Somewhere on your chip, you're going to have a pin that brings a chip on board. You can think in your computer with your microprocessor, there's one main chip, and that's the one they always quote you. That's the speed of that clock. And that goes into the chip, and then the chip can change it around. Maybe you need a clock which runs at half the speed, another clock that runs at a third of the speed. Notice it's not even a power of two. And PLLs are responsible for making all that sort of business happen. Now, if we were working instead in the, um, what's the other company's name? Xilinx world. Those don't have the same names, but they have the, basically the same functions. They have things called CLBs instead of logic elements. And a CLB is a uh, configurable logic block. And they arrange things instead of logic elements and those column things, they arrange them in something that they call. Uh, let me make sure I get the name right. Oh, I was looking at the wrong page. Slices. My data sheet's sitting here and I couldn't see the name. 
So if you were going to Xilinx, you'd talk about CLBs and slices. If you're at Intel, you'd be talking about LEs and or logic elements and embedded. Now, these things here may also ex live in the Xilinx world. But the column thing, and the way they have arranged them may be slightly different. A slice may just be a big chunk containing lots of CLBs. It may not be column oriented. So the, the internal technology, that's why we don't want to have to program these things by hand. We don't want to have to worry about the difference in technology if our boss says, listen, I know you programmed it for a Xilinx, but we need to put it instead into an Intel. Oh, OK, well, I'm not, that's going to be a painful activity. We need a program that can do that, very much like a software compiler can compile C or Java or something into a language where we don't have to understand the processor underneath. Now, in this class, we do. But when we are doing that as developers, we don't. So we don't want to necessarily have to know exactly how logic elements are laid out. If we were doing a full semester on it, oh, yeah, we would. And you might have to do that later in life if you decide this type of programming is for you. And I hope some of you it is, because this is the real computer scientists, the people that can do this hardware stuff and the software stuff. You know, I very rarely run into people, and when I find them, I generally hire them up because I like to farm those guys out because they can really make me a lot of money when they go to another company, and they know enough to replace two or three people at that company. And I find occasionally one here at this college. Everybody's going, ooh, that must be me I'm he's talking about. That might be. Okay, so what else did I have here that I wanted to make? Oh, yeah. One of the things that's also very important is any brand has something called user selectable input output elements. Now, why is that important? Well, that's important because I'm generally given lots and lots of pens to work with. Let's let's pull up a picture of one here. Uh, Xilinx, Vertex, Chip, Image, how about that? Let's see if they are here. Here's a small one. I don't know if I can get that picture big enough to see. Enlarge, there you go. Okay, you notice the pins? On each side. This has lots and lots of pins. When they get much bigger than this, they actually start putting them on the bottom in a ball grid array, like some of the CPUs you've seen. But um, this is this is not atypical of an FPGA. These are hard to solder. Let me tell you, having done that a lot, uh, but these are really really pretty uh, small. I don't know. If I could find it quickly. Um, oh, this is a Spartan chip, so this isn't very big at all. That's probably 144 lead twin flat back. I was looking to see here if they had the actual size of the chip. I just I came right back to this. Maybe not. Footprints. I don't have XLS stuff, but this machine has not been. Uh, I need to cancel here somewhere. What that does. Okay. So, but they're very small, and um, this is the package size that we would look. So, if somebody can look that up on your leisure. 144 lead thin quad flat pack, the TQ144. So that that's just a, a side thing because a lot of people think of these things as being like the size of your computer screen with lots and lots of wires. Oh, no, these are actually very, very tiny. 
But the user selectable I.O. elements, all those pins, you have to say what they're going to do. Because you're going to wire this on a circuit board to something else. So you have to say which ones you want to be inputs, which ones you want to be outputs, which ones you want to be clocks, because they have to be handled specially. Which ones you want to be able to be floatable, meaning they weren't going to be part of a bus. Do they need to be adjacent because of that? Is there something else? And generally, there'll be different standards you can meet. For example, the pin may only have the ability to go from 1.2 to ground. Zero is one, uh, zero, 1.2 volts is ground. Or you might need TTL, zero to five volts, where it knows itself that it needs to be between 0.8 and 2. All those things are selectable in the software when you're programming it. And you get to decide how your I.O. elements are laid out because you're going to be the one putting it on a board. And sometimes if you let the chip optimize or optimize it and then select things, you're better off than if you select them in advance and then tell the uh, software that it must meet certain timing criteria. It may not be able to because you've boxed yourself into a corner by picking where you want input outputs to live on the chip. We'll worry about that when we get around to it. But just be aware that that's a very important uh, thing we may need to know. Now, here's a good one for you. It may also include an ARM microprocessor. So inside the FPGA, there may be a microprocessor chip. And it'll be of the ARM type. I don't remember what ARM. It, st it stood for originally a RISC RSC machine, but I think it has a different name now. But you might have a microprocessor that you could program, and the two working together, the FPGA and the, its included microprocessor, could be a feature of that particular FPGA. Now, it's possible as well for you to embed a microcontroller, but we'll talk about that in a few minutes, meaning you might decide that some of the FPGA is going to be dedicated to generating a specialized microprocessor inside the FPGA. So, while you would never have an FPGA inside of a microprocessor, the opposite is possibly true. And these can be very specialized and very fast. But they're not exposed necessarily to the outside world as a microprocessor, but they might be. I've seen processors where they dedicated the FPGA part to doing graphic things. And when you put it in the machine, your configurator saw it as two separate devices. They didn't mention the fact it was all in a single chip. So that's some things we can look forward to thinking about. Now, they have something in these called the routing fabric. And routing fabric is how do different parts of the chip talk to other parts of the chip. And one of the things we have to tell it when we're telling it what the chip is, is what type of chip it is, because it knows how that's going to be done. And generally, we have to tell it how it's going to be set up and controlled. And we do that through configuration registers. Also, we might have something called configurable routing available to us. And we generally defer that to the software, or so the software description thing, when it's doing what we call place on the chip. It really is route, route and place, or place, place and route is probably the more common name because of the order. But it's, it's part of what we would do when we give the software the go-ahead to put this particular program we've written onto that chip. It has to figure out how to do it. So it has to set up, and we may configure, it, configure some of the registers, and it may configure them, either through configurable routing. But the net of this is it assures that we can meet design goals. We may have to, in our design, 
guarantee that a signal can make it from point A on the chip to point B and do a certain amount of logic in under 20 microseconds. It's going to be up to the software when it routes our uh, machine to be able to ensure that that can take place. And if we couldn't cause it to be able to set the routing inside of the chip, we would be in hard trouble. Now, let's, let's talk some more about this. I mentioned to you that these are able to be reprogrammed every time. But that's a benefit because that, again, supports the idea of reduced NRA or non-recurring engineering. Uh, and what we'll see with it is that it's because it's reprogrammable that's going to be less of an issue to us. So the non-recurring engineering costs will be less because of that. Now, they are relatively expensive per unit. So you want to use them for development, but you only want to use them in a device if you can afford to charge more for the device because you have a small audience. Um, but in general, these are great for a programmer because they're at the desk programmable with modern languages. Now, just like in software, you can go out and you can buy libraries of functions. But nobody's going to go out and make a math library. They're going to go buy one. Nobody's going to go out and get data structures themselves. They're going to get data structures that exist. Now, often the fact is these don't cost anything. And the same thing in hardware. We may be able to get what we'll call libraries of things. And they're generally sponsored by a company or something. We call it intellectual property. IPs. You may go purchase or you may get for free certain types of intellectual property. Some open source projects have intellectual property, although it's probably not going to cost you much more than following their directions. Now, we might, as I mentioned to you, go out and buy intellectual property, which is a uh, microcontroller. And an example of that, of IP microcontrollers, would be, I think I picked one from both the vendors here. Yeah, if you went to Intel, you could use what they call the NIOS 2. And I forget what NIOS stands for. The NIOS 2 is a CPU completely in firmware. And firmware is what really is what's used to program it inside the microcontroller. The microcontroller itself then is going to be put into by programming it into the FPGA just as another piece of intellectual property. There is no hardware CPU in there, only a software version. If we went to Xilinx, they call theirs. Microblades. And it's called the Microsoft Blaze Soft Process Controller. It's called soft because it's done in what's effectively a software implementation. Now we can get fancier than that. We can go out and get things, but we won't talk about them in here. It's things called systems on a chip. And they may include other things in the chip itself, things that, uh, like analog devices. They may include things with like operational amplifiers, things which are non-digital in nature, uh, things having to do with audio uh, generation. Very often, you can buy things that work on synth software synthesizers with a single chip, but the synthesis is done in analog rather than in digital, and then converted to analog. So SOCs are something else. So, you might find these implemented as CGAs, which is why I'm listing them here. But in general, that's not the case. 
So this, that's kind of the architecture of FPGAs, which we're focusing on. We kind of mentioned to you that if you were making millions of these, ultimately you would move them into something called an ASAC, which stands for Application Specific Integrated Circuit. An application specific circuit, we're not going to talk much about them, but we just say there is a huge NRE of those as you design the thing. You can't have the programmer program them, they must be programmed in the factory. So you want to develop on something else, develop the software, and then report it to this app after. They do cost low per unit, though, so they're very attractive if you have lots of these to sell. One of the problems is they may be, but may in case, may be bigger than an FPGA. And here I'm talking about internally. internally. What I mean by that? I mean, the main thing with two FPGAs is to be able to do the same things that they can maintain. And unfortunately, they have a different, different internal, internal structure. So your distribution of the program, program, program the FPGA, FPGA had better not depend on anything, on anything specific, specific, specific to that FPGA. That FPGA. FPGA. It doesn't care it doesn't about care slices, slices, it doesn't, it doesn't care, care about whether you use the configuration blocks. blocks. And you move it here and here, it's going to use a different structure. structure. So the program is going to be general and describe what you want. Not how, not how to implement, implement. very, very different you do with, you do with software. So, so be very, very carefully, carefully make sure that you're ultimately going to be portable, portable to an ASIC to have, to have that need. That need. And many, and many projects do. Okay, before, okay, before, before we move, move into the hardware, hardware description, on, just, on, just does anybody, does anybody have, have any uh, comments, or comments or questions? questions? Hang on, 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 hang
wouldn't be me unless we, unless we focused on this one. And they go, well, I'm in the U.S. I'm in school. Shouldn't I be doing Verilog? Here's my thinking about this. And it has proved to be very good with the people that have learned and then gone on and done serious work with this. So let's assume for a second you're very interested in hardware description languages and devices and state machines and all the goodnesses like microcontrollers and graphics cards and all that sort of stuff. And you ultimately like to design in that area. If I talk to Verilog, Verilog looks a little bit like C. Now, its purpose is still describing, but it, because it looks a little like C, People pick up a lot of bad habits when they learn it. It does the same thing as the HDL, but it looks a little different. The HDL, on the other hand, you kind of know you're writing for a device. It doesn't matter what the device is, because no matter we're going to write for a non-existent device when we write some code with this, because we don't care what the device is. It ultimately will fit or not fit in some device that we try to put it into. So VHDL means that if I teach you this and what's your appetite for it, you'll go out and buy yourself a little dev kit, and you'll learn to program it. In your and then if you ever have to go and work on a European project or a project in Asia or some projects in the U.S., you'll be all geared up for it. That's just when you go in an interview sometime and they say, what do you know? And you say, you know, VHDL. And I say, oh, it's going to take you about 15 minutes to learn Verilog. We'll teach you that, and then you'll know both. So if you ever really need to know it for a job, they're going to give you enough to learn it. You also might on your own go back and learn it if you're really enthusiastic about it. But I have found this is the place to start. And I'm gearing it up because I think you guys have the potential, at least some of you in here, have the potential, potential to do great things if we can unlock that. Let's unlock it. You know, yeah, some of you maybe not so much because you don't want to. I found pretty much in life that if you expect something to people, they'll give it to you. Unless they're just, you know, they can't quite figure it out. But people you know, usually rise to the occasion. So we're going to use VHDL. First part with VHDL is the what in the heck does the acronym stands for? I can figure out a little of it by just looking at it. But then I get stumped. Well... What it stands for keep my fingers near the keyboard here. It stands for VHSIC dash HDL. So it's an acronym embedded inside of an acronym. You can already anticipate that it's going to stand for VHSIC dash hardware description language. And we wouldn't be wrong. So, what is the first part? Well, it stands for very high-speed integrated circuit hardware description language. We're all friends, right? Yeah, we're friends. We'll just call it VHDL. We won't use its formal name, but it's very high speed integrated circuit hardware description language. And that pretty much says what it is and what it's used for. Now, both of these are used to provide a software description of what we would like a particular piece of hardware to do. And in doing that, we often are going to have to tell it through several phases about that description. So let's talk about VHDL in general. A lot of this actually is true also about Verilog, but nevertheless, VHDL will be our focus. Let's talk about the tools first of all. Vendor specific. Xilinx makes a product called the ISE Webpack Design Software. This is actually deprecated, meaning it's not to be used for new designs. 
However, they still have their Spartan chip. They did not extend their new product to do it, so you still have to use this. This can be acquired for free. Now, you do spend, you have to do a whole bunch of signing your life away to get it, but it, it can be used freely on their things. It won't work with other software so, or with other hardware, so you would get this if you're going to be doing it. Now, ISE stands for Integrated, uh, what is it, Synthesis Environment? So that's what the ISE part stands for. And we'll say, see what synthesis is here in a couple of minutes. Modern times, they also make a product used for their newer chips, which is called Vivado Design Studio. And I believe there is a free version of that or a trial version of something if you were, and there, you definitely can acquire it fairly cheaply if you bought some of their chips or you get a uh, development board in advance. Intel makes a tool which is called Quartus Prime. Quartus Prime. And Quartus Prime is, there's a free version and there's a paid version. And the free version lets you do any of the chips you'd go out and want to do at home. Now, this is important. It's a little hard to describe because there's so many pieces to it. But because, you you know, on a regular compiler, I write source code. I run it through something called a preprocessor. That generates, actually, is that, I want to say it that way. Yeah, I have to run through the preview. That generates assembly language, which is assembled, which is then uh, generally turned into an executable. And then finally linked and then run. So I've got all these different stages when I'm running a compiler. And various ones will be there, various ones won't, or combined with a regular compiler. With a hardware description language, we have different phases when we're going to be working. We have an editor where we're going to edit the files we need. You might run simulations. But to get the simulations, we have to take and we have to do something called analyzing. Or analysis. Actually, let me put that first. But before we do the analysis, we might check the syntax. We may edit it, and these tools all have editors. They all have syntax checkers. They all have anal analysis type of things. At least some of them do have them, but not all of them have simulations. So simulations is very important. Against the simulation, we're often going to run something called a test bench. And the test bench had to be edited, had to have its syntax checked, and had to have analysis done on it. Before we can actually run it, we also have to take those things we're going to run, and we have to elaborate them. Not all tools make you do that, but it actually happens. And then finally, we're going to do the simulation. The simulation is often done as what we call running it. So running and simulation are very often the same thing. But the thing we actually built uh, actually can't be run. So if I have a program, let's say I'm going to build a piece of logic. And I edit it. I ch syntax check it. I analyze it. It gets put into something called my work library. I'll just mention that up at the top here. There's something called the work library. And then I have to, in order to run that, either put it in some hardware and test it, or if I want to simulate it, I have to create another program which uses it and can actually do things that are not synthesizable. It's things that knows about how I want to do a test of a particular device. 
Now, if I didn't do a simulation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to do something called I'm going to fit it to a chip. And involved in that is going to be something called place and route. This is where I actually put it in a specific device. Before I actually did that, I had to configure my chip, the input outputs of it. But when I do a fit to place and route it, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make it meet my ultimate goals. I'm trying to get it so that it can meet, you know, the uh, requirements. Let's call it timing requirements. So you can see this is a little different, different than you would think with a regular program. But I'll need to be able to do each of these pieces in order to have what I need to do. Now, one of the interesting things is because I can run simulations and not put them in hardware, I can actually simulate pieces of hardware that don't exist. I can make up a new CPU. I can make up something. And by writing appropriate test benches, I can test that hardware to see whether or not it's you know going to do what I need it to do. I also can test something that doesn't exist until the point in time I need to fit and place it. And a lot of this stuff up to that point, since it didn't need to know anything about the chip, will then later be usable if I move it into an ASIC. The same program can be used. Now, after I've run my test bench, generally, what I have is I'm going to have to do a timing analysis. Which is similar to the timing requirements down here, except these are based on the software I ran. If I do this again, it's going to be based on the actual running it in the device. Putting it in the device is actually called synthesis. Synthesis. So I synthesize or I, I do synthesis to put something into a device. Now, the two things we're going to focus on will be, of course, simulation slash synthesis. In general, synthesis. In general, S benches will be able to be simulated, or right, will contain code which is eligible to be used in a simulation environment. And other stuff will all be things that we use that can be synthesized, actually built on a chip. A test bench generally will not go in a chip. Because it uses features of the language which can only be simulated, they can't be synthesized. Things that we synthesize, we may or may not include some simulation code in them, but in general, we're focused on making them able to be built because none of the simulation stuff can actually be put into a chip when you synthesize it. So for example, if I have a variable that needs to be initialized, that's a simulation thing. That's not a synthesized thing. I can't synthesize a constant into a chip. I have to set it with things like a reset pin or a preset pin. I can't give it an initial value. Things like describing how long it should take to get from an input to an output. I can simulate that, but I can't synthesize that because if I synthesize it, I really get whatever really happens. I don't get what I told it to do. I get what it does. So putting timing information over here is a waste of time. Because the chip will do what the chip does. Of course, I might want to simulate to see what happens if it were slow, and a test bench could test that. So we'll be thinking about these two particular words as we move along. Now, in general, when you program in the synthesis mode or even the simulation mode, you're going to be doing it one of, I'd say, three ways. Behavioral which is a way we program it, which would include test benches, because we're basically saying here exactly what do we have run and how fast do we want them to run. Something called register transfer level, RTL. And this, this is the stuff that can be synthesized.
And last of all, structural. We don't want to do this. This is down at the hardware level. Again, if we were learning this in a class or if you were on the job and had to debug something very serious, you would be poking around at this level. We want to generally be focusing on things that can be synthesized. And we also want to be able to write test benches, which are behavioral. This is where our test benches will be. Now, to do all of the above, we need to have some software that we can run. And the software we're going to run will not be these expensive programs up here. We're only going to have two nights to work on this and then the exam, and then you'll, some of you will be assigned assignments with this a little later. But we're going to use a couple open source pieces of uh, software. One is called GHDL. The other is called GTK Wave. Oh, I spelled this wrong. I did this last time I taught this too. I spelled it wrong. Oh, that's even spelled worse. GHDL. It's like VHDL, but with a G. It's from the GNU open source. And it's not their exact project, but it uses their license. Two pieces of program. This one is going to take care of syntax, analysis, elaboration, and the GTK wave is going to take care of demonstrating or showing our timing analysis. So between the two of them, both of them are available on Windows, Mac, or Linux. The distribution I put together only runs on Windows. And those of you that have Windows, when we start to do this tonight, should follow along using it. We're going to use your favorite text editor, whatever that is. Mine is going to be Notepad. You could use, you know, if you were running on Linux G Edit, you could do VI. I mean, you could do Vim. Uh, you could use Notepad. Plus plus. You could use text edit on you know, Windows. I mean, there's any number, but they have to be things that use text files because the programs run themselves require that. When we use these, you're going to see I've included a couple batch files in the distribution. If you're in Windows, don't double click on those. And if you're in Windows, don't run those until you know exactly what they're going to do and then run them at appropriate times only. If you are on Mac or Linux, these are both very easy to install. It took me less than 10 minutes last night to install both of these on my Linux machine. Unfortunately, I can't use that install for you because of the way the machine is set up. And they also, on Linux, do a couple nice things. They get rid of at least one of the batch files for you. So what we need to do is we need to spend some time getting this set up for ourselves before we would use it. And I'm not going to be able to help anybody with Linux or Windows. So if you're using one of those systems, you need to, in the background, you know, on the chat or any other way you're talking to those people, get yourself set up. It's not necessary if you're running Linux or Windows for you to follow along tonight, but it is necessary for you to get it all set up before the next class. And again, your people in the class will help you or you can figure out how to run a Windows, you know, one of the uh, Windows on Mac type of things to get it to work for you. Now, you are going to be running using the command tool. So it'll be the command tool on Windows. It'll be uh, command prompt on some versions of Windows. It may be a shell. It may be called your terminal. Whatever the name of it is, that's where you'll be working. Now, what I'm going to do is as I'm going to open a copy of my command tool on the window. Okay, now mine is white with black writing. Yours is going to be black with white writing. You might choose to switch the colors or something. I made mine a little bigger so it's easier for you to see. What I need for you to do first is I need for you 
to extract the contents of the VHDL file, VHDL.zip that you downloaded earlier. Now, before you do that, it's going to create a VHDL directory, which you also want to leave on your desktop. However, when I double click into this, there's another one. When I double click into that, there's another one. When I double click into that, I actually get to the files. Leave that unnecessary structure as it is. Even though it's going to have too many levels of direction in it, leave it the way it is. There's some historical reasons why it's that way. And I may give you some batch files later that depend on it. So go ahead and unzip that on your desktop. Remember, if you ever screw it up and get it really awful, you can always unzip it again as long as you change the name of the first one to something else. If you needed a fresh start. So it shouldn't take you very long. It takes a couple seconds for that to do it. So give me a green light if you've unzipped it. Okay, so almost everybody has that done. Now, you can unzip it if you're on Mac or Windows. The only thing is there's a couple places in there you're going to have to, or Windows or Mac, I mean, a couple places you'll have to not run those files because they're not for you. Okay, so it looks like almost everybody got there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go into that directory I showed you. So to get there inside command prompt, to get to command prompt, if you don't have it on your desktop, you can just, while you're searching, type CMD. And when you type CMD, what should come up is um, a thing that lets you open that window. Let me undo it because I got it wound up stuck on my other window. Okay, and when you get here, you should, unless you've done something to avoid it, wind up in your home directory. So it's either C or D, usually, colon, backslash users, backslash, whatever your login ID is if you're running Windows 10. And then you're at the prompt. If I do a directory here, not a SUI, but a directory, I got a lot of files on my desktop. CLS will clear your screen. OK, now, the file we want is called VHDL, if you uncompressed it. So I'm going to do a CD or change directory space into VHDL. Oops, I didn't. I missed my phone. I was doing the wrong thing there. First thing I have to do is go to the desktop. So I'm going to do a CD space desktop. Now, if you're not in your home directory to start, you need to figure out where that is and what the path is so you can get to your desktop. I forgot because I was going to show you how to do that, and I forgot to show you. Now I'm going to CD into VHDL. You may do this with me. I'm going to CD into VHDL again. One more time. I should be at users, whatever your name is, desktop, VHDL, VHDL, VHDL. Now here I'm going to do a directory, DIR. If you were on Windows, on Linux, Linux or Mac, you probably do an LS. And in here, we have several files. The first file, GHDL. Now, don't you do this, or you might get lost wherever you're headed. I'm just going to go into that directory. In there, there's two directories or three directories. One is the bin directory. One is an include directory. One is a lib or lib directory. Inside the bin directory, by CD to bin is the actual program we're going to be executing, ghdl.exe. Don't execute it yet. I'm going to CD up a couple directories. I'm back in my VHDL directory. And in here also is a GTK wave directory, CD to GTK, GTK wave. Don't you bother doing that. In there, there are going to be the three things, a bin, a lib, and a share in this case. Inside the bin directory, 
a bunch of programs. The one of which we're going to actually execute is GTK Wave. I'm going to go back up. Now, I have a notes file. Open that file up and just keep it somewhere. I'm going to do it in Notepad. I'm just going to say Notepad notes.txt. And just stick it off to the side somewhere where we can get to it in a few minutes. OK. Now, I created a directory called play. If we do a CD to play, you'll find one model program in there, just kind of a it's not even as much as a hello world. We'll come back to that. So up one level. Now there's a batch file. Don't run that. Next thing is a VHDL golden reference guide.pdf. This is a reference for you to look at on the VHDL language that you can kind of look at at your leisure. It's very light reading. It's easy to look at. And if you get stuck on something later, you can come back to that. Then we have a work directory. In the work directory are a bunch of VHDL files. And there's a batch file. Don't execute the batch file. Leave that alone. There's also in here a subdirectory called state. If I go in there, there's the implementation of a state machine and another batch file. Again, don't execute the batch file. I'm going to go back up a couple of levels and get back to my VHDL directory. So this file and that file are the executables. This is the installation for Windows of GHDL. This is the installation of GTK Wave for Windows. Both of these are Windows. If you're on Mac or Linux, these two file directories are not useful to you. Notes gives you information about the commands we can execute, and we'll try some in a few minutes. Play, we'll play around in later. This file we'll come back to in just a second. Here's some documentation that's good to read. And finally, the work directory has some files that we're going to be using when we play, not when we play around, but when we work around. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at this file. I'm going to put it in a notepad. Not Don't double click on it. Don't Type on it, or don't use it for anything. So I'm going to take that file and put it in Notepad. We'll look at it. What it's going to do is it's going to set two environment variables. The first one is this thing called ghdl prefix. It's just basically going to take our current directory, append ghdl to it, and lib to it. So that somebody in their program, if they're looking for the, this guy, can find the library easily. We just need to do that. The current directory means we have to be in this directory when we execute this file. Then we're going to add to the path the current directory ghdl bin and the current directory gtk wave bin in front of the whole path that we currently have. So this sets up the path for Windows so that when we just use the name of the programs, we'll be able to execute them. If you're running Mac or Linux, you have to either make changes to these, or in the case of Linux, you just throw this file away. You don't need it. In the case of Mac, if you were to change it, this is not percent CD percent. You probably need to put out the entire name. And your files in here are separated by colons, not semicolons. So it's a real easy conversion. The name of the file needs to be .sh, or get rid of the .bat at least. And you need to mark this file as executable if you're running Linux or you're running uh, Macintosh. For us window people, the ones that are running Windows right now, what we can do is in the window, we can type sat and the name of that. The easiest thing is do, since you have nothing else named sat, just hit set, then hit tab, and it'll just put the name there for you. Run that. And when you run it, it may not be dramatic as mine is, but it sets the GHDL prefix to this name. Notice it expanded the current directory for us, so we didn't need to know about all those extra VHDLs and everything. 
It also added to the beginning of my path, a path to the, uh, well, actually, that's where I am. The path had added to it at GDL bin directory, and it had added to it the GTK wave bin directory. Now, every time I open up a command prompt and I navigate here, I have to do that again. It's not permanent. However, I, while I have this window open, I don't have to do it again. So it's safe for me to do a CD to work. Now, inside the work directory, I have a bunch of VHDL files. I also have a batch file, but we're going to stay away from that for the moment. The files named what they do. This is going to be a program which can make a piece of hardware do a two input AND. Here's one that can make a piece of hardware do a four input AND. Here's one that can make it do a two input OR. Here's one that can make it do a shift register of four bits. Now, each of those could literally be analyzed and have their syntax checked, and they should be fine. If you were running Linux, by the way, you will get an error message when you do this because one of the files is named something that Linux cares about. But that's something that's easily fixed. Notice for everyone that can make a piece of hardware do something, we have this thing underscore TB. TB stands for test bed, meaning this program right here knows how to test that piece of hardware. This test bed here knows how to test that piece of hardware. Now, we won't bother going into the in, insides of them at the moment, but we'll look at what happens when we uh, run them. You don't need to do this, but I'm going to type a directory again. You'll see in here also we have this batch file and we have a state file. This is a subdirectory I showed you earlier. We're not going into that yet, so we can just stay at this level. Because we use the current directory above when we created those path names, it still remembers where the programs are. In here also, we might have our work library. But because we haven't done anything yet, we don't have a work library. To do it, if we ran it, would cause all of the things to run and it would do everything this folder needs to do. But since we're learning how to do it now, we'll stay away from that. Don't accidentally double click on it either. OK, so let's assume that I wanted to make the AND2 program be able to be synthesized into a piece of hardware. Well, first of all, I need a program. I have one. So I can say ghdl.syntaxcheck, or dash s, the program I'm going to check is and underscore two dot VHDL. So do this along with me. Type GHDL space dash S space and underscore two dot VHDL. Make sure you're in the work directory and make sure you ran that batch file while you were in the directory above this one. Hit enter. You check the syntax because we got no error messages. We know that program is syntactically OK. I'm going to run the directory command again. You may or may not. It doesn't matter. You'll notice that it created a new file for us. But actually, it hasn't happened yet, but we only did the syntax. Let's now analyze that program. GHDL dash A space and underscore two dot VHDL. No, no errors should occur. Now, if I do a directory now, you will see that the work directory has been created. To look at the work directory, I can say ghdl-d. And that will tell me that currently in there, there is an entity named and underscore two who happens to have an architecture. And the architecture's name is Arch. 
Okay, we don't know what that means, but that's fine. If we ever wanted to get rid of the whole library, we could say ghdl c Couldn't do that. Do the directory again. You'll see it's still there, but if we see a ghdl-d, there's nothing in it. So we need to reanalyze that file. ghdl-analyze and underscore to dot ghdl. GHDL, I'm sorry. And it would have created it. We can do a GHDL to see that it's really there. Okay, so that was fairly straightforward. There was nothing too exciting going on to make that happen. Now we need to elaborate the program. However, because this program's in the library and it's it can be synthesized but not simulated, meaning this thing has in it nothing that is behavioral. All it has in it is register transfer level code, which means that it can go into a device and then we could test it in the hardware, but we can't test it just by running it because it doesn't do anything that we could test. We're going to need to create a test bench which will test it. So we don't need to analyze this guy. Wouldn't hurt if we, I mean, we don't need to elaborate this guy. Wouldn't hurt if we did, but we don't need to. There are times when we might want to, even if we're not going to simulate it, but we, well, I'll show you those when we need it. Let's now take, and let's actually do the elaboration just to be complete. We don't need to, ghdl-e. Now here's a difference. We don't give the name of the source file we give the name of the entity, and the entity's name is and underscore two. There is no dot VHDL. So let's run that. Now nothing will have changed. If we do a GHDL dash D, nothing changed. So now what we want to do is we want to take and check the syntax of the test bench. GHDL dash syntax and underscore two underscore TB dot VHDL. So we're going to check the syntax of our test bed. Let's do that. There were no errors. So we need to analyze that. VHDL dash A and to TB dot VHDL. I'm sorry, we don't want the TB. Yes, we do. We're, we're doing the test bed now. VHDL. So we're doing an analysis of the source file. GHDL D should show it in the library now. Now we need to, anal uh, to elaborate it. When we elaborate it, because it uses the AND2, it's going to make sure that other file actually exists. So let's do GHDL E. GHDL I'm sorry, underscore 2, underscore TB. But we don't need the .VHDL because we're using the entity name. We do it, it says it can't find the name that I just created, and that's because I spelled it wrong. And that worked out just fine. So now, you don't need to do these steps I'm going to do at the moment. I'm going to illustrate something. I'm going to clean out the library. Nothing is in it right now. I'm not going to do the GHDL under, or the AND2 guy himself. I'm just going to do the test bed. So let's uh, analyze the test bed. Let's elaborate the test bed. Notice that it tells me that the other thing was not done yet. So the test bed is going to use the, the AND2 file. Since it hadn't been created first, the elaboration caught that whatever you need to do doesn't exist yet. So let me make it exist. So I can say ghdl dash uh, analyze and 2vhdl I can rerun the elaborate of the test bed, and it's perfectly okay because we put it into the library. 
So anything that depends on anything else means the other thing has to exist before it will succeed the elaboration step. Now, usually on Windows and Linux, you don't need the elaboration step. You need it on Mac. But on Linux, you can make it force an executable file for you, which will run the test bed without using the GHDL prefix. We don't need that anyway, so I didn't turn that option on. But if you get on a Mac and it complains because you didn't run the elaboration, just run it. And remember, the elaboration is different than the syntax or the analysis in that it only uses the entity name, not the file name. Now, normally, you want the entity and the file name to match. There are cases where that might not happen, but let's pretend like that's a rule for now. Okay, hold on just a second here. Okay, I had to move my coffee out of the way and I couldn't reach it. Okay, so there's another GHDL, no particular reason to tell you about it, but GHDL-V shows that I myself am running version 0.34-development. And mine was actually committed on you know, March the 2nd in seven, 2017. I think this is European I don't, or American. I don't remember. Okay, so if you needed to know that. Now, that sheet I told you to print out a while ago tells you all of those things we just did, except we there's a couple more we haven't done yet. Remember this guy? Here's these commands. So the unit under test goes here. Its test bed would go here. It would an elaborate would look like. I just showed you two analysis. These aren't in order. You don't do them in this order necessarily. Actually, you do them in this order, but you may do more than just those. We're now going to look at how we run the test bed. That's going to basically be this command right here. So if we want to run a command, again, we're going to use GHDL. This means we want to simulate whether or not that works okay. We're going to say ghdl dash r for run. Then we need the name of the entity we want to run. In our case, it's always going to be a test bed. It's and underscore two underscore tb, and it's the entity name. Then we have a strange little double thing. It's dash dash vcd equals. Now, what we really should name this is and underscore two underscore tb dot vcd. But I guarantee you somebody will forget, and they're going to wipe out their original source file. So just for now, until you get good at doing this, name it vcd.vcd. And then run it. And if I look at my directory, you'll see that that file now exists and contains some stuff. This is the timing information based on what the test bed, which is AND2 test bed, did to the AND2 entity. So we want to look at that particular thing into a file. So we're going to use the other program we have, which is GTK Wave. We're going to name our VCD file, vcd.vcd. Let's hit Enter. Now, you may or may not have seen a splash screen, but you'll definitely get one of these. The problem with splash screen for you guys and my stuff is it's on the other screen so you don't see it. And what we'll see is we'll see a way to look at the timing diagrams. At the top, we have the ability to se select a component or not. When it's not selected, down at the bottom, I'm going to see three signals, signal one, signal two, and signal three, which happen to be registered signals. If I do highlight it, I'm going to see the three signals named as A, B, and Y, which are their external names to the entity that we, we're looking at. So these are the internal names. 
Those are the external names. Now, we'd actually like to see the timing. So to do that, and you should be doing this with me, highlight, grab, and my fingers down, drag it over here. Drag the next one. Drag the next one. Now, I apologize. I can't make these any taller. You're just going to have to squint, or if you're doing it along with me, you can look at your copy. Now, this doesn't fit the screen because these are in femtoseconds. And femtoseconds are something like 100 or 1,000 billionths of a second or something. It's a really tiny unit. And ours is running at one nanosecond separation, which is even too small. And we'll fix that later. But because of that, we need to type on the keyboard Shift and Alt at the same time and push F or push the magnifier with the little box inside of it. I'm going to push the magnifier. And what it'll do, it'll show us the results of the timing. Now, without looking into the test bench yet, we can see that A and B, which are the traditional names for an AND gate, were initially unknown. So was the answer. If I highlight that with my markers, I can actually read the values over here. Over here in this section, I can see 0, 0, 0, or if I highlight them with the marker, I can see A and B are 0, Y is a 0. That sounds like that's correct for a two-input AND gate. Over here, 0 and 1 are a 0. That would be true. 1 and 0 are a 0. That's true. And then finally, the only one that should be true, 1 and 1 should create a 1. 1 and 1 should create a 1. So that looks like we managed to produce from our test bench what looks like good responses. Now this, because we just opened it with a uh, uh, with typing the name, is holding this window. So we have to hit the X to get back to our prompt. OK, in here also is an OR2 and an OR2 test bed. Why don't you see if you can type the commands that are necessary to put those into the work library, and also then to bring them up in GTK Wave so we can check them. I'll give you a couple minutes to work on that, and then I'll do them, and you see if you follow the steps. I would write down the steps I'm doing so that even though we have a list of them, you'll know what we were doing in order to make that happen. And once you have that function open in GTK Wave, give me a green light. Now, you'll also be eligible of going out and buying yourself a T-shirt that says, Bostain says I'm a cool guy or gal or whatever word you want to use there. Cool dude probably is a better term. Okay, two or three people have already finished. That's good. The rest of you should be pretty close to being done. Okay, a couple more have made it through. Okay, I think we've got plenty of people that have gotten through. What I would probably do first is I probably, and you may not have done this, but I probably would do a syntax check where I wrote this. So just make sure both of them syntactically are okay. Then I would analyze one that's synthesizable. 
And then I'd analyze one with the test bed. Now, it's not strictly necessary that I elaborate the first one, but I will anyway, that day when it is necessary. Oops, and I made the mistake I was always making, which is it is only a entity name. It's not a file. Same thing with the test bed. That's ready to run. I have to run the test bed because it's simulatable, not synthesizable. And it's the entity we use again. And we can use you know, vcd.vcd again. Now I can do a GTK wave on vcd.vcd. My window came up. I'm going to select the component. Move my three guys up in the line here. Do, you know, Shift, Alt, F, or hit the little button here. And here is my signals. Undefined, undefined, undefined. Zero, zero, zero. Now, as you can expect, Y to be anytime any of them are ones, or the rest of them are ones. So I get zero, one, 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 zero, one, 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 one. Okay, now at this point, this is being held, so I have to close that window to get back to my prompt. Give me a green light if you got that right. Give me a red if you had trouble with it. That's okay. If you have trouble, you've only done it once. Okay, so that'll give you a, some, some necessary practice in that, but hopefully you're seeing the pattern here that we would be doing for that. Now, what I want to look at is just because I know somebody has wondered about it at this point. Uh, good bat contains those things. And it puts them because they're hardwired into the correct named BCD file. So if I weren't learning how to do them, I would just type do it, and it just does everything. Now, if I do that, now look, I've got test files for everything, so I could say ghd and run. i no, not run. I'll do gtk wave. I've already run all the programs, and I could do you know shift for pv.vcd and my main unit here brings up a whole bunch of registers, one of which is a clock. Let's see, here's a reset. Here's a something in. Here's a bunch of registers listed as registers. Here's an output. I could make them fit the window. I could expand this. So I could, you know, I could do some pretty good analysis here of what's going on after running that. But also I need to be able to do it in my hand because as we move to other directories, there won't be batch files necessarily. I think I have one in the state file. I would right now browse around in here but not do much with it. Uh, now, let's take one quick look at the contents of one of those files we've been working with. I'm not going to do any detail right now at all. Or to uh, VHD. Oh, let's do Andrew. Let's do Okay, in here, we have what look like standard headers for some sort of a language. We're using an IEEE library, and then specifically in there, we're using a package called Standard Logic 1164, and we're using all the items in there. We could qualify, but that's like a star in Java or C++. We have two areas, an entity and an architecture. Remember, we saw both those in the work directory. In the entity, we name the entity, which should match our file name, say it is. And here is the entity. And the entity, all we're defining is a port. And the port has all our inputs and our output. Two inputs, one output. And they're of type standard logic. 
Obviously, we don't know what that means, but we could certainly use this as an example to copy or learn from. Then we say we have one architecture whose name is Arch, and he's an architecture of AN2, who's the entity that happens to be in here with us. And he has a begin, and then he runs a signal assignment. He just takes A and B and assigns them to Y. And this happens constantly. This never ends. It happens constantly. We just described the problem. We didn't give it an algorithm. We just said, if A or B are different, you know Y might change. So this thing should constantly keep doing that. So we put it in hardware. Whatever pin A and pin B are, they're getting it ended together, and they're coming out on pin Y. So this is the way an executable and something that is actually synthesizable in the hardware looks. Very simple, but it's the way it looks. Let's look at the actual test bench for this. Can I have the same two sections? Of an entity, and it'll have an architecture. The test bed doesn't take any inputs and produces no outputs other than the timing diagram, which are internal. So it needs nothing to describe itself. But this will go into the work library so we know we have an AN2 test bed. Here's the architecture test of this. It's of that. And what do we have? Well, we have a component, which is the AN2. That's the AN2 we wrote, right? We were naming it. It is like having a declaration in software. Our port for the component, this is inside component, looks like this. So this is an exact copy of the other guy. So basically, cut and paste this right here. So now this program knows what an and two's inputs and outputs look like. I got a big declaration in a higher level. Now we create three internal signals, S1, S2, and S3, who all happen to be of type standard logic. These are neither in or out. They're, they go both ways. Now, here's that begin we saw earlier. So there's some declarations, then begin, then the executable. First of all, we have a port map. The port map says, I'm going to create something called A2, which uses that AND2 entity we had. And I'm going to map its port so that its A is attached to my signal 1. Its B is attached to my signal 2. And its Y is attached to my signal 3. Now we're going to create a process. This process is going to run. And it's going to make use of these connections, basically. We're going to set our signal S1 and S2 to unknown, which in turn means B and A got set to this. Because this is running all the time this is running. And they're running constantly. Then we're going to wait for a nanosecond. Set them both to zeros, wait for a nanosecond. Set them to zero, one, one, zero, one, one, wait for a nanosecond. And then ultimately, we don't want this to run again. We want this to only run once. Then we'll just wait. If this ever left this process, it would continue running. But this guy runs forever. He just keeps running and running and running. At the same time, this guy is running. So anytime our signal one, two, or three change, it's potentially A, B, and Y change. We know if A and B change, Y potentially changes. So it's three processes. One is this port map. This is a process in which these happen sequentially. If these, by the way, were not in a process, they wouldn't happen sequentially. They'd happen uh, in parallel. We'll talk about that in another episode. So this is basically the way a test bench works. We could have something more complicated. So, you know, if I uh, my keys, no, Notepad to four testbed dot VCD. Actually, this is the VCD file itself. I didn't do what I meant to do. I meant to actually look at the testbed. What we would see is in here, the process is a little more involved because we're setting more signals, but we're still in age waiting for a nanosecond. 
This waiting for a nanosecond cannot be synthesized. It can be simulated, but it can't be synthesized. Therefore, this can't be something that you can stuff into a chip unless you're willing to say that that's not going to happen. This will happen, that will happen, that will happen, that will happen in sequence. It's because we're inside a process without a sensitivity list. And because of that, the weight between them would just be whatever the chip did. And it's probably similar to whatever the propagation delay time of the chip is. However, we might already be changing the next reset before the answer appeared. So this would probably not be safe code without a little reworking to put inside of a uh, actual FPGA. Now, we're at a point right now where you know just enough to get yourself, I should say, in trouble, but I won't. What I'll say is you're going to make sure that you can start, where is one down here? You can start a command prompt. You're going to make sure that you can CD to your desktop, and you can CD into VHDL. Three times, I think it was. Putting us at this directory. At which point, because I started a new command prompt, I have to do the batch file again. So set tab, make it happen. CD down into work. New directory to see what's there. And then if I wish, I can look at any files I want to, and I can start studying these. So I can say notepad and for .vhdl. And I can see how we implemented for input and. It may not be the way you expect. Instead of A, B, C, and D going into something that knows how to do four ands, we're going to make it out of two and twos. So we have one component that we're going to use twice down here. Give it a different name. One does A and B, one does C and D. But they're the same thing, but they're port maps mapped to different signals. So this will give you plenty to study and be ready to write some code for me on Wednesday evening. Anybody have any questions? If you're done with the command prompt, the other way to get out of it is to just type the exit. Uh, yeah. just, one quick, just one quick question. Uh, did uh -huh. you actually want us to run the uh, do it dot bat uh, on our command prompt? I probably wouldn't, but it won't hurt if you do because you can then run the individual ones anyway. All right. And you also can just delete the folder, if you, or not delete the folder, but re-zip, unzip, and start from scratch if you had to, if you really screw things up. All right. Okay, anybody else have any comments? Okay, well, then I will see you Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. And you guys be ready. We're a lot of EHDL that night. Thank you. Good night.